Welcome everyone to day three of the 2020 Freedom from Slavery Forum. I'm Professor Zoe Trod. I direct Rights Lab at the University of Nottingham in the UK. Our focus today is empowering and learning from survivors, but we're going to be talking about how to move beyond talk. So many of you, most of you will be familiar with the language of being survivor-centered, survivor informed, survivor-led, it's what we're all aiming for. But how often does that go beyond statements? What does that look like? How can organizations that aren't survivor-led nonetheless be survivor-informed? What does this look like for lawyers, for service providers, for businesses, for governments, for researchers? And really importantly, what does it look like right now for survivor leaders, survivor scholars, survivor advocates themselves? What should it look like? We're hoping that you have a lot of questions for our panelists today, so please do put them in the Q&A thread. Um, and then we invite comments in the chat, which is also at the bottom of your screen. Please do put your name, your organization, your location into the chat. We want to capture that for our written report of this forum. And um, we want you to let us know that you're with us. On behalf of the advisory committee for this year's forum, just to thank to express gratitude to the Elks Family Foundation for their really vital support of the forum. I'm going to turn to our moderator, Tina, who founded House in the Washington area of the United States. She was appointed by President Obama to serve on the US Advisory Council on Human Trafficking. So over to you, Tina. Thank you so much, Dory. I really appreciate that. Um, I just kind of want to introduce myself. I'm Tina Front. I'm the executive director and founder of Courtney's House. Courtney's House is a survival-run organization based in Washington, D.C. We provide direct services for youth 11 to 24, average age 11 to 17, boys and girls who are trafficked, um, not only in the Washington, D.C. area, but around. We offer direct services, support groups as well at H. Robin Center location. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Not only do I want to thank you all for joining, I want to thank you all for joining so very early in the morning. So thank you while you're in your pajamas and comfy. Let's get ready for a wonderful, amazing lineup who are some maybe up a little earlier than you. We have um, a wonderful keynote speaker today, Deborah Pembroke. She's out of Monterey County, California, Ray Crisis Center. So we all know she's up early and she's decided to be here as well. She will be followed by our, um, she will be our keynote today, which I'm really excited to hear what Deborah is saying. So please feel free, hold your questions so that you can ask her lots of questions. Um, she'll be followed by our panel discussion today. Our panel discussion is Sophie Otendo. She joins us from Nairobi. Sophie, um, where she works for Liberty Shared as Regional Operations Manager for Africa and sits on the board of the Heart of Kenya. Ima Mutel joins us from Los Angeles, where she is the Program Manager for National Survival Network at CAS. And Sarah Bissell is the Deputy Director of Human Trafficking Legal Center and joins us from Washington, DC. We'll put up their bios later in the chat so that you could take a look at that. I'm so happy that they're all here. We're gonna have an exciting panel. This panel is going to be a discussion panel. So that way we can have discussed topics and later you all will be able to ask questions and I'll be able to call upon you for those questions around. We turn now to Deborah Pembroke, who is the Human Trafficking Outreach Manager again at the Great Crisis Center. We're excited to hear her discussion. Please welcome Deborah Pembroke. Well, thank you so much, Tina, and um, thank you so much for everyone who's here gathered together. Thank you for the important work that you do. It's really humbling to be um, with so many of you this morning. I wanted to begin our time together with some examples of survivor leadership. From 8th century enslaved flutist and Sufi poet, Rabia of Basra, to the author of Don Quixote, Miguel de Cervantes, to Frederick Douglass and Billie Holiday here in the United States, to Nadia Murad, 
um, in modern times. Survivors of slavery and what would today be called trafficking have invented genres of art and literature and been masters of statecraft and advocacy. Through the lens of history, survivors are world changers who bear gifts that have resonated for centuries. Each of these survivors have without question reached the pinnacle of human achievement. As a survivor of human trafficking, I know our traumas and the stigmas we live with are deep and wide. And yet I know that when it comes to having our voice heard, when it comes to creating change, when it comes to making something no one thought was possible before, history again and again shows us that survivors lead. As we come together today, we are recognizing the 20 year anniversary of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act and the Palermo Protocol. There is so much to celebrate. The work of the past 20 years have been hard and necessary and created real change. Change in the lives of so many survivors in my community, change in my life, change in the lives of so many of the people that I know rippling out from the work of all the people here today. And yet I know that this is not the only anniversary we are recognizing this year. I am speaking to you from Monterey Bay, California, where we are recognizing the 250 year anniversary of the Spanish colonization of our area. From listening deeply to the first people of our community here in Monterey Bay, particularly human trafficking survivor leader and Esalen Tribal Vice Chair, Carrie Herthel, we know that good intentions and a wish to rescue and save can be a very dangerous thing. How the work is done matters and who it impacts matters. And sometimes despite good intentions, history reveals the true impact of our work. Because as much as we have to celebrate the real change of the TVPA and of Palermo, we have also seen issues grow into problems and now in the age of COVID explode like a wildfire into catastrophe. Survivor leaders and our allies have grown hoarse asking far too many anti-trafficking organizations to do better with outreach, to end the use of language around rescue and saving survivors, to be accurate and to end sensationalism, only to be told that we don't understand. People with degrees and salaries have told us that a compelling message was more important than accuracy that the sensationalism was necessary for funders or for donors or for politicians or for public awareness. And now history is showing us the results. What happened when those who make decisions in a movement that is separated from those most impacted by their work, the acceptance of sensational disinformation and our movement has left us vulnerable. And I fear the results are apparent now that state actors with political agendas are using the anti-trafficking movement and survivors as pawns. QAnon and other extremist ideologies have weaponized the same sensational messages that were used far too often for their own political purposes, using social media to spread disinformation like at lightning speed. In my community, the understanding of human trafficking has been set back years, if not decades. So how do we learn from history? How do we build a movement that is grounded and resilient and ready to transform our communities and end human trafficking? We acknowledge that it is no longer enough just to listen or empower or learn from survivors of human trafficking. Survivors of human trafficking need to be in charge. I'm not talking about a few luminaries who through the, live through the horror of our experience to share an inspirational story. I'm talking about a broad-based, diverse array of survivor leaders with experiences as wide and ranging as our trafficking experiences. A place to start is with our language. For the last four years, I've served um, on the CSEC advisory board for the state of California 
for um, the CSEC action team. A group of survivors across the state with diverse backgrounds and experiences in childhood sex trafficking. We conducted a survey, a survivor conducted research survey um, of 56 different organizations serving child trafficking survivors from child welfare to direct services. Although 90%, over 90% said that having survivors on staff increased the quality of all of their programming, only 27% actually had survivors on staff, survivors of human trafficking on staff. And all of those survivors of human trafficking who are on staff were at low paid entry level positions. Remarkably, the majority of these organizations, 65% said they were survivor informed, yet had no professional engagement with survivors. Some cited listening to their clients who often were just affirming the work they were already doing. Some cited hearing survivors at a conference as all they needed to do to consider them or their work survivor informed. So as much as I want you to get good quality information from our 90 minutes together today, I know that this presentation alone is not enough to make your organizations survivor informed or survivor centered or survivor led. We created a word cloud of the different language that the respondents used to why, what barriers they faced when they tried to hire survivors. What we heard back from the organizations was a profound projection of lack. They thought survivors were lacking in what was necessary to do the work. But I put forward for any organization that would feel that Frederick Douglass or Nadia Murad or Tina Front or Ima Matul lacked the skills that, your, that an organization would need, this would be an issue more with that organization and their internal structure than with survivors across the board. And we know that this sense of lack, this sense of not enough is about trauma, but not the survivor's trauma, but the vicarious trauma of our allies. And don't think for a moment that survivors aren't grateful for what everyone here does and what so many of our allies do. I am deeply grateful to every single person here who is engaging with the work and doing the hard work of ending human trafficking around the world. Survivors understand trauma. We know how it kills creativity and makes us believe that the only way forward is repeating the things that have already been done. But we also know that trauma, all of our trauma can be healed. This will take honesty, accuracy, and organizational reflection. Right now, where is your organization on the survivor leadership ladder? Are survivors relegated to fundraising and storytelling, asked to knuckle under our trauma and share the worst moments of our lives for a goal that we didn't have any power in setting? This is the lowest level where survivors decorate the work but have no say in it. Are we low wage or even unpaid workers given tasks but no power or influence? This is an assigned and this is the assigned and informed level. Or we brought in as consultants, asked questions and then said goodbye. This is informed dialogue. Or is the work truly initiated by us, designed by us, implemented by us? Are we sitting on boards? Are we in upper management, determining the scope and breadth of the work? These are the upper levels of this ladder. This is where we want to be, to have a robust, forward-thinking, resilient, anti-trafficking movement. So rather than talking about organizations being survivor-informed or survivor-centered, which sadly far too often is just a label slapped on business as usual, or calling our organization survivor-led where it's just a single luminary who's the only voice. Instead, let's talk about true survivor governance where survivors initiate, design, implement, and evaluate. 
where survivors have power and capital, where survivors from a wide array of backgrounds all have a shared impact and capacity to create real change. Our movement has a wealth of strong, smart, creative, compassionate, and powerful survivors who are truly understanding what it takes to heal our lives and to heal our communities. We are ready, we are with you, let's do this together. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Deborah. That was amazing. We're going to virtual have lots of hand clapping for you. That was good. And you brought up a lot of great points. If you have some questions for Deborah, please hold them. You can put them in those questions and answer thread because we're going to be back later with her to answer those questions. Right now, Deborah's also going to join us on our panel that I told you about. So we're having a panel discussion. So right now, we welcome your questions. Again, please put them in the question thread. We're gonna get back later so that we can answer those questions for you. But I would love to invite to our panel, Sophie, Ema, Sarah, and Deborah back. Please join us so that we can have a panel discussion. All right, great. Thank you all so much. I'm really excited. Um, today, I know we're talking about as well the pandemic and, you know, where that brings us, but it's not just the pandemic that brings us, kind of how, where we are and how we're dealing with things as well, but also with maybe the people that we work with or we provide services to. And with that, Ema, I, I wanted to ask you a question. How have you noticed that this pandemic is affecting but you personally, and then the other survivors you work with in the community, how is it affecting you all? Good morning, um, everyone. Um, well, that is a great question, Stina. As we all know, this pandemic is affecting all of us. Um, it hit us really hard. We weren't ready for this situation and um, especially this country. Um, so especially for survivors that as those who have, you know, don't have an office job who has a, um, um, you know, like as a, um, who works on the field um, lost their job, you know, especially the work, the survivor that I work with, who also uh, rely on just doing consultations. So it definitely affecting them, you know, financially affecting, you know, their family, affecting their, you know, mental and health well-being, and. Um, so we we have to to shift um, our focus. Um, what I do at CAS is a survival leadership development program. Because of the pandemic, we have to shift our focus in helping survivors, supporting survivors either financially, mentally, you know, um, in in a, a physically as well. Because uh, I work with. Uh, some an elderly survivor as well. And the survivor that I work with or the one that I'm in community with who have not um, that um, connection to service providers or they're not like a current client. So they are not um, um, qualified for the grants that they have, you know, because most grants are only for clients, but not for those who, you know, are graduated or those who are not uh, in services. So what I have to do, uh, I'm sure many of us, you know, uh, do a fundraising, you know, reaching out to uh, allies, reaching out to partners, you know, um, asking for, for help and 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 um, giving those um, uh, survivors in 
in my group specifically in my community uh, with providing them with rent assistance, uh, providing them with um, you know, a uh, gift card for groceries and helping them filling out, um, applying for unemployment benefits, any other benefits that, you know, they may qualify. I thank you for that. That was in depth, but it also leads me to another question then for Sarah. Um, Sarah, what role does litigation play in a survivor's recovery? What Ima is saying is, you know, very true. There are so many other things in layers. So as an attorney, Sarah, what does that do, those litigation play in a survivor's recovery? Thank you, Tina. Um, that's a really good question. I think that the choice to pursue litigation can be so empowering for our clients taking justice into one's own hands. For example, you know, the choice to choose to accept a settlement offer or to continue to trial, uh, the choice to even file litigation, file litigation to begin with can be so empowering. But what we have to remember is that successful litigation is so dependent on the stability of our clients. Legal representation cannot be divorced from ensuring that a client is receiving, stabilizing social support and services. And in addition to that, I would note that, you know, it's not the lawyer that is responsible for defining justice. The client is, the survivors are, and it looks different for each person. And so I think that for the lawyers in the audience, that we need to think of our role in justice as part and parcel of a survivor's recovery, not the only part of their recovery. Um, how does that fit in to their larger uh, journey on their way to thriving. And also, you know, you might come across a client that is not interested in litigation. And again, you know, to the empowerment point, that's their choice. But, you know, while they might not like, while a client might not be interested in pursuing litigation, survivors have a host of legal needs that they require to undo the harms of their trafficking, be it a custody battle, um, the need for family lawyers, pro bono family lawyers, Tax issues are a huge part of um, representing trafficking survivors that I was not prepared for coming out of law school, as well as other things like name changes, setting up businesses, patent law, so looking to, uh, to looking to IP lawyers. So there's a whole host of legal needs that survivors need beyond just that immediate recovery, but legal needs that support them in thriving and growing. Thank you, I appreciate that. I think a lot of people can get a lot of insight because I think that we think of one or two layers on trafficking survivors about their legal needs and not all the other things that they may need. So thank you, Sarah, for that. And that really leads me to Sophie. Sophie, you've worked in the anti-trafficking movement for over 10 years at the local, regional, and the global level. What do you think the movement is doing right and what does it really need to do better? Uh, hi everyone. Uh, this is an interesting question because it's a reflection question, a question on what has been done right and what has been done wrong. And one of the things that I wanted, I think just building on what some of the things that people have said, building on what Deborah has said. I said this uh, a while back uh, in a different setting. And I would like to repeat it. If your organization is involved in direct services or is dealing with survivors and you've not, and you've created a program that cannot empower a survivor to replace you, you are not there yet. That's if you forget anything else, this is what all of us should be on a path to making ourselves jobless because we are empowering survivors that can take over your seat if you're not a survivor. So the question is looking at what has the movement done right, right or what has the movement not done right. In survivor inclusion specifically, the survivors have consistently consistently been seen as recipients of services. Despite everything, we've 
it doesn't me, Tina, and most of the survivors who are highly qualified, to say the least. If you two, I've said this while we've been with Tina several places and the other survivor leaders, if some of us just took out the word survivor from our CVs and basically presented it in other places, would really be highly qualified for several things. Most survivors are committed and are getting lowly paid in this movement simply because they are passionate and simply because they went through something painful and they don't want somebody else to go through it. That's the main motivation. So let's, what the movement has not done right is taking advantage of our passion, taking advantage of the fact that regardless of how we are treated, we are so committed, we are going to stay here. Most of the other people, most people are motivated by the fact that their careers are going to be ahead, they're going to be paid more money, but for most survivors, this is personal. And the movement has taken advantage of that and that needs to change. And that needs to change for those asking, how do you do it? I've said the bar is, if you are a legal company, and Sarah is my friend, so I can say this, the Human Trafficking Legal Center, its programming needs to be looking at, can we have a, a survivor that can do Sarah's work? Is it possible? If you are the director of any organization, the services you're offering survivors, can they empower survivors to become who you are, to do what you do? That's the kind of empowerment that we need moving forward. And that's the kind of survivor leadership and survivor inclusion that I'm actually hoping for. We can talk about uh, and that's not, and to be honest, that's going to take a lot of humility and it's going to take a lot of questioning of what we've been doing. And that's not also going to happen in the silo that we've created for ourselves as a movement. Because some of the issues that we are facing, some of the issues I'm facing as a black woman, as a result of racism in this movement are not things that some of your, some of your organizations can handle. Some of the issues that I'm facing as a woman are not the issues that some organizations are prepared to handle. So we are going to have to admit that whatever we have at the table right now is not enough for the need that most survivors have. So we need to open this table. We need to get out of this silo that is the movement. And we need to start asking ourselves questions the root causes of trafficking are not going to be addressed by us consistently sitting on panels and talking to each other and having the same resources that we had last year. That's not going to happen. It's only going to happen if we open the table. So my call moving forward is what are, if we are going to do to correct some of the mistakes that we've made is we have to open this table. And my, I, my call for survivors, and I know most of the survivors that I know are completely amazing. We are really done begging for inclusion. Uh, and the next five, the next movement is not about survivors actually doing the work. Some of the things, if I can point out some of the good things that are being done. <laughs> I'll, Sarah has spoken. I love what Human Trafficking Legal Center does. And Sarah knows looking, especially some of the strategic litigation that has been done and the whole movement of lawyers that are actually looking at justice as a form of care. I think that has been amazing work, expanding the definition of justice using research, researchers that have actually become really survivor-led and really survivor-informed. I'm going to give a big up to Helen Swan and her Chabdai team and the Butterfly Research, educating us, you know, looking 
exactly looking at information and really being vulnerable and honest about the things that you're doing. So definitely did some of the research that is being done by, by, by people who are really conversant with what is going on has been amazing in really educating us. Some of the organization doing direct services, of course, someone like the amazing Tina. I mean, you just need to go to this. If you haven't seen what Tina does with the youth, you need to go and see it. Some of these models are all over the world showing people that you can actually do it. For me, one of the amazing things that has, I've seen also has been the whole movement moving towards community care, where we are looking at survivors going back into the community and rather than offering just direct services and survivors being dependent on one person. So I think those are some of the things I think we've done great and that the things that I think if we think about will continue. I still think we need to do a lot on data. I would like that you, Deborah, you spoke on misinformation. We can't be misinformed if we are collecting correct data and we're inter interpreting and analyzing correct data. And that most of that data is with survivors, is with organizations that are offering direct services that are also not funded correctly. So my hope is that as we move forward, those are some of the things that we are going to change. Thank you. Well, I really appreciate that, Sophie. There was just so many good points um, and what you said to have a discussion about. And I see those questions coming in and questions and answers, I'm gonna to get to them. So please put your questions in there and we'll be getting to your questions soon. Sophie, you brought up a great point because I'm um, old. <laughs> and been doing this uh, work and this movement for over 20 years. I'm gonna say that there is another divide that I think um, that actually begins. So when you start anything with a divide, divide gets, gets bigger and bigger. And that divide is international survivors and US domestic survivors. And that divide was put in very early in. It's put in very early in when you recognize one form of trafficking and not the other. And so that means for national survivors in the US, there was more funding more time and there was more. So what actually happened was a divide started saying, nope, for a national is more important than US citizens within organizations, not within survivors. So when that divide started and anytime you know money is involved and it divides it more. So there becomes a fight and a rift between them. Then what happened was of course us as survivors don't have a divide and we see a bond. So I still see that there is a divide in the movement of that, which also brings on racial divides, as Sophie is saying, which also deals on trying to put one down to get something better. So how can we move past that? And then what is the impact that we see within survivors? So I see that it got a little better. I, I do think it got a little better. With anything, we have a lot of change and there's probably a piece that we don't think about as much. Deborah mentioned a lot in her presentation about survivor leadership as well and where survivors need to be in the movement as Sophie did as well. Well, there was a point I did wanna ask you, Deborah. So survivors continue to report being exploited by the anti-trafficking movement. So one, I, I want want you to explain what that means to you if someone's being exploited in the anti-trafficking movement. And then of course, how do we stop that and prevent the trauma, Deborah? Well, I just really, um, I'm still resonating with, I think all of the wisdom Sophie just dropped. Um, that, you know, um, I think probably with a lot of people on this panel, I've had the experience of, um, you know, talking with people who are, you know, including like very young people who are very deeply still being exploited, talking about their own vision for their future, that as much as they can see a possibility of something being different for them in, in the future, right there, right immediately while they're still in the emergency room, while they're still, you know, sitting across from us talking about what might be possible in their own lives, 
they're saying, I want to have a voice in making sure what happened to me isn't happening to other people. And this is an inherent part of surviving trauma, to want to make a difference, to want to create systemic change from what happened to us. And so we have this really genuine, compelling desire to create change. And it's broad, it's not a few remarkable survivors. It's a broad experience across you know, many different sectors of society. And we have organizations that see a particular role for survivors um, that centers in those traumatic experiences. So when we talk about survivors um, coming forward in the movement and you know, being seen as storytellers only or being seen as um, the people who come to the gala event or the people who you know, are on the brochure but not integrated into the work, you know, as Sophie so well stated, you know, replacing so many, you know, survivors stepping into every sector of governance in our movement. This can lead to just a real separation from where survivors know what we're capable of, what we can do, and what the movement is seeing. And I think the barriers are varied and the, the barriers are real. And the work that we've done so far hasn't created enough of the change that we need. So it is not an uncommon thing to hear from survivors who've been in the movement for, for a few months, for a few years. You know, survivors have been in the movement for a very long time about feeling um, exploited, feeling like we're only relegated to certain activities. So we need to create real change. We need to be honest about what work has happened so far. So I really appreciate this question, Tina. I think you know, we have to you know, speak honestly in spaces like this, but we have to also really put, these, put this wisdom into place and um, move forward with it because um, you know, real systemic change is needed. I, um, yeah, thank you so much, Tina. Thank you, um, really. And Sophie and Deborah, I mean, the best points that you all had. Deborah, you mentioned something about having young survivors, you know, speak and speak up or tell stories um, for funders. So Courtney's House works with 11 to 24 and there is a false representation of sometimes you wanting to speak up. And I wanna talk about that. Sometimes people, adults as well, say, hey, I wanna speak up because they feel like they owe you something. It's up to you and the program to understand that they've been out, it doesn't matter if they're 40, six months, a year, that they're not ready because you're telling them how to speak. You're not telling them that when they leave that stage, do you know people come up to me and ask me things like, oh, wow, you're abused. Did you have your children all the time? Do you know the invasive questions that they ask you? Do you prepare them for that? Usually you're not, and you're not ready for that, but they have a voice. So what are other ways that people can get involved? How do you get leadership, right? Inside of your organizations with survivors. So what we do at Courtney's House is our youth have a youth policy group. And our youth policy group actually focuses on policy and they speak up about the policy. So that's one way and it's paid. So we got funding for the youth policy as well. Then we recently got a grant and that grant is with OVC and it's actually with lawyers, which will bring us to some of our next questions. And it's with the New York Lawyers Association. And right now we are creating a um, manual for how to apply for jobs and a job training manual for youth and adults. So our youth are getting paid as consultants, consultant fees inside that grant. So there are so many ways that they use their voice that they're not ready to say it's them. We do a lot of audio clips, 
promotions about other things, fun events, not showing their faces. So I think there are so many creative ways that you can think of that's still going to impact, but also helps them and build their skills, which really leads us to EMA. EMA, that really leads us to how organizations and funders can best uh, support for survivors impacted by trafficking. How can they support them in the organization? Um, how can they do that, Ema? That leads us to that. How do you do survivor leadership in your organization? Um, great questions. And this takes me back to what also Sophie was saying earlier. Um, survivor are capable to do anything that other, you know, staff or people are doing in their organization in any level, like what Sophie was saying earlier, how can we have the job? Can we be on that level? How can an organization support that? Like, you know, as we all know, um, who are sitting here on this panel, like, Survivor has a lot of barriers. Um, I want to give an example to me personally. Um, and uh, for an example, like I'm right now managing a program. I know I can be a director. I know I can be the CEO of this organization. I know I could, and I'm capable to do that because I'm so passionate about this issue. And but how am I going to do that? Or how can other survivor do that? Um, you know, like I said, we have so much barrier in our life, you know, we were, for me personally, I was, you know, traffic since I was teenagers, and I did not have the level of education that I should have, because I don't have, you know, is I don't have money to pay tuitions, um, you know, to, to be on that level, how can I go to law school, how can I go to like, you know, get a degree that I need to be in that position. I know I have the capability to do it, but it's just that barrier. So how can organizations support that? You know, like, well, education, you know, like how can you help, how can organization help to for survivors to be on the level that it needs to be, to be on the level that they wanna be, um, you know, providing them with, you know, scholarship, that is a huge barrier. There's a huge gap in the anti trafficking movement. I get so much requests and, and questions from other survivors like, hey, do you, is there like any scholarship that I can apply to? You know, we all want to have that, you know, degree. We all want to have a high education, but it's just the barrier that we have. And you know, as many of us know, like we're, we were traumatized at such, a, you know, um, and exploited at an early age. And our brain, it's, you know, sometimes it needs, um, you know, help. It needs like, um, you know, our health also that we, and sometimes survivors don't have the luxury to, um, to do that, you know, to, to be healthy, because like we have to take care of our family and all that. And honestly, for me, it's like, I want to be, you know, I want to go to school and all that. I want to be uh, having, I want to have that degree, but how can you support that? Well, thank you, Ema, because you bring on some other valid points about organizations and what else they can do, which really does lead me to Sarah, if you're not, right, a survivor-led organization, what can they do to be more inclusive and survivor-informed? Sarah, how can that happen? How can organizations do that then, especially lawyers? Well, I would first, you know, that slide that Deborah Pembroke put up on the leadership ladder, I would print that out and slap that on the wall of your hiring management or your operations team and look, really look at that and consider how can we actually actively implement that into our organization? And you might say, well, we don't have the funding to create a new position. Well, okay, so think about how do we integrate from the top down, the board, an advisory council, a consultant, then staff. And I want to know that I, 
intentionally started at the top. And there's always room for more board members. There's always room for an advisory council. You might not have the funding to create a new staff position, but what about a consultant? And in addition to integrating survivors more intentionally into your staff, and then I also want to caveat that you can't just integrate them, you actually need to be prepared to listen to them and their critiques of your organization and your model. So for instance, what are the products and services that you provide to survivors? So many of us in the movement are focused on providing survivor, um, um, survivor uh, um, services for surviving, apologies, it's the morning for me, um, services for surviving. But we need to do, as Sophie has so, and Ema have, uh, has so articulated, we need to move beyond surviving. And so, you know, are we providing services that educate survivors and provide them with scholarship and the, sk the skills that go beyond earning subsistence wages to uh, skills that get them into the boardrooms and launch them into leadership roles? And I would also note, you know, in the development of those products and services that you provide to survivors, were survivors represented in the development of these services? Uh, and if not, do you currently solicit critical feedback from survivors? And then do you actually integrate those critiques and, you know, have the humility to course correct your programs as well? And, you know, I would end with, you know, ensure that your programs are in line with the best practices developed by the survivor community. And if you're wondering what those best practices are, you just have to ask, you just, you know, and don't just ask, hire a consultant and pay that survivor to tell you what you need to be doing. Thank you, Sarah. Valid points um, about hiring. And I want to say, do you have protocols and procedures in place in your manuals for the hiring process of survivors? That could be another piece of making sure that's in there first. And what would that be? At Courtney's house, yes, we do hire survivors. However, you have to be out of the life for five years and you have to have two years of consecutive counseling. And, and see kind of where they are. Because as Ema said, sometimes a lot of things happen within your life that you may need help or may move you back. So we also want to make sure that survivors have the right tools to thrive in their positions. Sarah, that brings me to another point to you though. Lots of people say this, right? Oh, we need to have survivors on the board. We need to have people, you know, doing this, this is what they need to do, but they're not doing it yet. Sarah, what, is your organization doing right now? How are survivors represented in your organization on the board or a council? How do you all utilize survivors? So at the moment, we currently, uh, Evelyn Chumbau, who is an amazing survivor leader, currently sits on our board. She recently joined our board. She was previously on our advisory council. And so we welcomed her to our board this past month, I believe. In addition to that, we work frequently with survivor leaders as consultants. So again, while we might not have the ability to create a new staff position, we really try hard to integrate survivor consultants into our work. So to that end, we work frequently with Finus Lapenga, a survivor leader. And I want to say that, you know, in addition to um, integrating them into, uh, excuse me, integrating survivors into your staff, you know, we actually work very hard with Finus to integrate her into our trainings so that when we are training pro bono lawyers, we make sure that a survivor is part of that training and we don't ask Finus to tell her story. That's not what she's talking about when she's training our pro bono lawyers. She is training them on her experience working with lawyers and on cultural competency. And she doesn't talk about her story it just is that one component. And in addition to that, uh, Roxy Farrow, another survivor leader, is on our staff. And Roxy has been an integral component in developing our survivor leadership webinar series, plug for that. Um, Deborah has been on that series as well. And that has been a, a, new, a new direction of our work that was largely informed by the feedback that we received from survivor partners on the need for developing survivor leadership. We again, don't have the funding to create a scholarship at the moment, but what we can do is try to provide other tools that enable survivors to gain the skills that they need to be leaders. Thank you for that. There are some great questions in the chat. Please get your questions in there. I'm actually gonna to go to them. So some of your questions, some of you all have questions and you're nominates. So I won't read a name, I'll read the question now. 
Some of you have your names. I can call upon you. You'll be able to unmute and ask your question. It can be if you are asking directly to someone, please ask that person directly. If it's open to the panel, then let me know it's open to the panel so that we can discuss. Uh, let me go to some of the questions. So, uh, we have a great question. Um, so can you all please share the guidelines for having survivors um, put this type of input in our organization to ensure their continued health and consideration is taken into account? How do we do that, Sophie? I think some of it has already been mentioned. And I feel like some of the things that the first step the first step is that there has to be a political will to actually want to have survivors there. You can have all the protocols, you can have all beautiful words written, but if you don't build a culture where survivors feel included and feel, I feel like they're actually, your organization wants, wants them to be there, it's not going to work out. So one of the things, and I think this has been said, I do not think that it's actually possible to create a safe space for survivors without consulting survivors. So we can share guidelines, we can do all those things, but in the spirit of actually saying, how do we get this done? I'll say, the way I'll answer this question is by saying one, to create a space that is safe for survivors, ask yourself, how many survivors do you have? How, how do you get input from, from them? And how do you bring them on board and actually sit down with them and get that feedback? In terms of sharing guidelines and protocols, I'll say this, Sarah has said, so many survivors, some on this panel, have guidelines and protocols. And I will say, please consult them, consult them, pay them what they are worth. I think I, I, I insist that survivors need, we need, if, if this, this conference, uh, this forum is about moving to the next level, the next level is to stop to, to actually ask ourselves where we are why we are constantly asking survivors to educate and actually have to relieve their trauma and do all these things for our own benefit. And it's the whole question of privilege. So I'll say this, all this information is out there. Survivors are not have been in this movement from when the movement started because it was started for them. So the first way to develop a protocol is consult, consult and consult. But some of the good practices have been mentioned by Tina. Have they recovered? Can you be able to provide long-term support? Can you protect them? Are you realistic about the expectation in terms of what you're asking them to do? Has that been communicated to them? Have you empowered them enough? Because the, also the expectation of finding a well put together survivor that is ready to be on your board and the lack of commitment in investing to, to, for care to get them there is a disconnect. If you want a survivor, again, if you want a survivor that can be on the board, can do all these things, the question is, as an activist, as someone in this movement, how are you fighting for long-term education? How much are we fighting for social protection system? systems because for me we we also have to move from this place of you know scholarships and everything the reality is we need to talk about government social protection systems countries should have free education right why do we need to beg for education honestly it's a, it's a basic need. We need to move. And that's why I, I go back to my argument. We need to open this table up. We need to start fighting for social protection system. Free healthcare should not be, you know, something that is controversial. You know, free education should not be controversial. And all those things are pertinent to this movement and should not be offered as direct services. It's the responsibility of government. Sorry, having had a little technical difficulty. Um, you know, you bring another good point. And I think that's why it's important to consult with survivors um, as well, because 
what can you do about free and healthcare? All our services at Courtney's House are free. We made a contract agreement with Children's Hospital to have free care for our youth. So what are you doing to make sure that that's free and not emergency free, right? Like you just need some meds real quick, but the follow-up appointments, all those services as well. Um, and then really there are some great questions. And so one of the questions I have, you all, whoever on the panel it should answer this. So please let me know if you wanna answer this interesting question. The experience of survivors of trafficking are so different. What one person says is a solution another may not agree with. On top of that, multiple layers of identity-based oppression make things harder for some survivors to be heard compared to others. Any thoughts on this? Anybody wanna answer this on our panel? Please unmute and feel free to do that first. Deborah and then Sophie. Um, well, this is why we need a broad range. We need lots of survivors, um, survivor um, networks, survivors able to engage each other. I know mm -hmm. I've learned so much from um, my fellow survivors um, that, um, uh, and I also want to really name that um, the point that this, the person who asked this question was anonymous, but it's a great question. I really appreciate it the um, different identities because surviving survivors come from deep vulnerabilities in our community and survivors it, lives intersect with the, the areas of deep oppression in our community. And sometimes what we see in the anti-trafficking movement is an elevation of voices of survivors who come from relative privilege. And that's something we also need to look at and name that we, in making sure that we're hearing from a wide array of survivors, survivors from very different experiences. Tina talked about within the United States, hearing from um, survivors who have the, the immig immigrant experience, including refugee experience, including asylum seekers, people who have this um, experience of um, coming to our country, but also survivors who are from this country survivors from different you know, class backgrounds, survivors from different uh, racial backgrounds. We, we know that human trafficking impacts so many different communities, but impacts people of color in the United States disproportionately. And we should see that reflected in survivor leadership. Sophie, can you expand on that, please? Yeah, definitely. I Again, I go back to that. We go back to the whole consulting survivors. Most of these answers, most survivors, if you are survivor informed, you'll be survivor centered. You'll, this, you'll understand that trauma affects us differently. So it doesn't, trauma is very objective, subjective. Tra trauma is also very cultural. The way, so having someone there who basically understands the culture of the person that you have before you to actually tell you what you are seeing. But I, and I've, again, this is a conversation I've had when you think about the development world and NGOs, and we have to reflect as service providers, as people who are in this movement. And I'm very, we are very, you, we need to be radi like radically honest and vulnerable about this. Most people, and Deborah mentioned it from the beginning, most people come from a place of good intention, right? But what most of us don't talk about is how many organizations have a savior complex. And as a result of the savior complex, it's extremely difficult for you to believe that the person before you has the blueprint to their healing. Because if you have a savior complex, you cannot believe that the person before you doesn't want to be saved. You cannot believe that the person before you can tell you exactly what they need, how they need you need it, and exactly what they need to, to do to get there. I will say the key here is humility, humility, humility. We need to be humble. 
we really, there's a lot of humility that needs to come. You cannot be an expert in someone's experience. You cannot be an expert in someone's feeling. I don't care how many degrees you get. You absolutely cannot be an expert in someone's healing. And understanding that then makes the person before you important because they can educate you on what needs to happen. So for me, the only way is to focus. And I know that coming from an, an organization, like I used to work for HART and I know how overwhelming it can be to offer direct services and to have to listen to each person individually and provide quality care. I know I'm not going to take, to, to take. and that's why the, if we broaden this conversation, it's not just about you who's sitting there and is trying to talk to this survivor. This is also a call to the donors. It's also a call to government because this cannot be done. We need to do this together because if, if you break the severe complex, then you realize you need more people, right? You realize that you don't have answers for Sophie who's sitting before you because Sophie is different from Aima who came yesterday. So you say, I don't know. And then you bring in other people that can be able to help you. But if you have a severe complex, then it's difficult to say that. Thank you both Deborah and Sophie for adding to that conversation and putting a lot of knowledge within that. Now, remember, I can call upon you and ask a question. You can unmute your phone and you'll be able to ask your question. Joa, we would love to hear your question. Would you like to read that, please? And you can pick the panelist or the whole panel to answer. Hi, Tina, thank you very much. So my question has, to do with um, inclusion of um, survivors in organizations, and particularly around recruitment process. Um, what, what would be the appropriate wording in a job advert, for instance? Uh, it's common side to see female applicants are encouraged to apply and other special uh, wording. Is it appropriate to say, for instance, survivors are encouraged to apply? And through what medium is it possible to reach survivors, especially in places where there are no survivor association or perhaps authorities that tend to work with survivors are not able to you know, disclose identities for good reason. So if any of the panel can talk around you know, recruitment process and how to purposefully target survivors uh, for recruitment purposes, thank you. Deborah, please. Yeah. Um, so, Jonah, thank you so much for this question. Um, so, you know, I want to, you know, both convey to everyone that there are good, actionable steps that you can take right now to um, move in this direction. There's good things like, you know, being explicit, you know, survivors are welcome to apply for this position. Those are great steps. But I also, want to make sure we're not um, minimizing the scope of what we're talking about. Because if your workplace, if you already know it's a deeply toxic workplace where there's a huge amount of turnover, where it's, um, you know, it's a difficult environment, then there's more work to do than just um, saying sur survivors welcome. Um, that when we talk about, I mean, Tina's laid out some really practical steps of, you know, at, at amount of time um, away from the exploitation, an amount of time in healing. You know, how profound would it be if every staff person had access to that kind of deep healing of like two years of counseling? Or, and I'm, I'm talking about non-survivors, for every staff person, to have that kind of fluidity with understanding them, our own selves, to be equipped with that in doing work that we know for sure causes vicarious trauma for everyone involved. This is hard work. We look squarely at very, some of the hardest things that happen to human beings. And so what makes a good healing, helpful workplace 
for everyone. And that's culturally specific, as Sophie's talked about, that's, um, you know, uh, needs to be um, reflective of the entire community you're working in. How that lays the groundwork for real success for um, survivors. And so it's, it's, it's these simple steps, you know, making sure we you know, have a good workplace, making sure we have, um, you know, we have an intention and a clarity in recruitment and making sure we're doing this for positions, not just with, you know, as we've talked about, you know, fundraising or peer support, but really every position across the board that, you know, when survivors are invited to the table, it's again, not just for storytelling, but for curriculum development, for, um, for counseling, for HR work, for really every aspect across the work, across the board within an organization. Um, and I will say finally, um, just another thing I wanted to say here is that when we think about having successful survivor leadership in our organizations, and if what's coming up is some of what we talked about earlier around that lack, but we don't have people who are ready to step into these positions. What we do know is that for years, survivors who have wanted to be working in the anti-trafficking movement have had to step outside of the anti-trafficking movement in order to really see successful leadership. We have survivors leaving the movement and stepping into real leadership in tech companies and in the business sector and in other arenas. And that is a huge indictment because there is no lack in survivors capacity and ability to create change. Thank you for that. Um, quickly, Sarah, uh, that kind of really falls on a question for you all since you do have survivors on your board, hire, how do you all get survivors? How do you find them? How do you do that? We, you know, we do a lot of intentional recruitment. Um, you know, it's not, we don't put a, a board opening up on our website and say, you know, come on, on down. You know, we recognize that we have a need that a survivor leader is actually critically assisting us in being a better organization and a better um, support service for the survivor community at large. So we really try to recruit. Um, we often work with leaders, survivor leaders that we know or we receive recommend recommendations through the community. And we really try to you know, maintain those strong ties with the survivor community as well. Uh, and so I think that's, it's really that snowball effect in, in that way we've been able to um, really make sure that survivors are threaded through our entire organization, not just a decoration on the weave. And I love that you said not just a decoration on the lead. Thank you for that. I do want to make a quick announcement before I go to Ema, just very quickly. This is being recorded because this is being recorded in a few weeks. You will be able to access that. I'm sure that Free to Slaves will be sending something out about how you. So remember, a few weeks, it is being recorded. Ema, please, um, your question. I'd love to hear your comments. Yeah, so I want to add uh, to what Sarah um, just said on how can you, you know, I, I hate to use this recruit uh, my <laughs> language, but I don't know what other word that I could say because that's not empowering language in the anti-trafficking movement. Um, so the way, how can we get survivor involved in, you know, in your organization? What I see within, you know, the organization that I work with or any other organization who works with survivors, leaders, um, we see the potential within the survivors. If you see that survivors have the potential to to be a leader, if you see the potential of that survivor to be on the board, to be directors, to be a consultant, how can you empower them to go to the next level? So with, with mine, um, for an example, with, with my position before I was just, um, well, I was one of the founding member of the leadership program and I was just a volunteer, just being involved, like what Sophie said, like we're so passionate about this issue, even though we don't get paid, 
we do the work. And um, so like, you know, um, someone like staff uh, within the organization see my skills, see my leadership skills, see that I can do this. So that person has empowered me to, um, to, to, to be on that, you know, leadership position. They hire me at first, you know, like other organizations, I seen that within other organizations as well. So if you see the potential in someone to be a leader, to be a staff, to be a board, to be directors, or even to be the CEO of an organization, support that and empower that and providing them with the with the tools that they need you know if they need to take training they need to go to school like do that and thank you for that that's true what can you do within to help them now um i do see another question i may not pronounce your name correctly so let me apologize up front but marina um you had a question first we are gonna to have to unmute you first before you'll be able to unmute yourself. So Marina, if you would like to talk, they will unmute you and you'll be able to ask your question. Or I can ask the question. So I'll ask that question. It's supposed to be to Sophie and I'll answer it as word, Ema, and I'll answer it as well. In your opinion, what are the most meaningful and safe ways of involving young under 18? Your old survivors into anti-trafficking movement. Sophie, yeah, I think I think this is a really good question because I I think most of the time when we talk about survivors and we talk about engagement, we really think we don't think about children. We don't think about how children can be able to participate actively. You know, how can children be able to participate actively? And I would say that this is one of those areas where the, the human trafficking movement does not have to start from scratch. The child rights movement has a whole, has been discussing child participation in programs for years since people started. So let's not redesign the wheel. There are a lot of things that have already been done in the child rights movement, which they should be on the table as we're expanding our table and have a conversation on how children participate. I mentioned some of the things that when I was at heart, we did at the shelter, our, our shelter, which uh, took care of children who are between the ages of six to 18. And that will, and then I'll actually, some of the things are things I actually learned from Tina uh, and the, her drop-in center when we were setting up because when we opened the shelter, I reached out to Tina for help. So one of the things that, for example, we did was the fact that we allowed children basically to be the one to develop the rules within the shelter. Then we asked them, what, would, what are some of the things that would be important to, to you basically in terms of your care, in terms of what you want to do, in terms of the culture that you want the shelter to have. And when you came to, to Heart Shelter, Everywhere you went, you saw writing that was done and developed by children, rules. This is what is important in my room. This is what I want it to look like. So we are going back to how do we give children agency, considering the fact that the law actually says that children do not have agency clearly. So how do you do that? So that was one, uh, one of the things that we, that we actually did. Something I learned from Tina from uh, the drop-in center was Tina actually allows the children who are in her center to be the one to actually uh, introduce the center and basically ensure that anybody that comes in uh, is, you know, understand what go, goes on. And basically it's amazing because children have their own language that some of us don't understand. So allowing children to actually explain your programs is something that you should constantly do. Art has been an amazing way to involve children. You want children to give feedback on something, use art, paint, write, ask them to write. We did a lot of storytelling with the with the girls that we had at the shelter and not tell your story aspect was what is your opinion on this and what can you think about this situation and we had children just 
you know, work. I have seen amazing, and Tina will talk about, I've seen Tina do amazing work with children on policy. I mean, I'm absolutely amazing. So first of all, you have to come from, an, from a place where you actually think children have something to tell you. If you think that they don't have something to tell you, they won't have anything to tell you. One of my proudest moments as someone who, is take, who took care of survivors was when a group of survivors that we had taken to a school, uh, we, had taken, we, had we had taken them to a school, basically went, almost started a, a strike because of their rights. So they went to the school and basically the school asked or was doing, or was doing the teachers were doing corporal punishment. And the girls at the shelter had been taught that corporal punishment was wrong. And they, we had done a whole exercise where we had spoken to them about universal, the universal children's rights and what it says, and they had discussed it. And essentially, these girls stood and said, no, you're not going to do this. And this is the reason why you're not going to do this. I was called, of course, I was like, OK, we, we, I don't want them to be kicked out of school, but I was so proud that they had actually learned something and they taught other people. So ensuring one of the ways, if you're working with any group, if you're working with any group, if you use a lens where that particular group is at the center and you're constantly asking them questions and involving them, it is very, very easy for you to not go wrong. So if you're working with children, consult children. There are ways to talk to children. Thank you. Um, so I think when, again, we think of how we're going to use youth in our programs, we immediately go to how we're going to use them to tell their stories and say things and use words like it empowers them to tell their story and get it out there. Um, but again, everyone is different. So how can they feel empowered in the setting that they're in already? So yes, um, ever since I started Courtney's House, everything is a choice. Everything at Courtney's House is um, really about the services I never get as a survivor, being a minor, and what I wish that I would have had and people ask me my own opinions. So one of the things I think is important is it has a real say in the organization. So at Courtney's House, youth actually are involved in the hiring process. And that means for survivor service coordinators, we don't call them case managers at Courtney's House. We now have therapists. We don't call them therapists. We call them one-on-ones because we're using the words that the kids wanted to use to describe their program. So that's the second thing we do. We use the words that they would like to use to describe our programs and we did it. The next thing that they wanted to do was have a voice, right? I felt like they should always have a voice in the hiring process of who's gonna work with them. They should. So actually they have a real voice. So I think it's a different hiring process um, where that makes others a little nervous that apply, but I think it's great because I need to know how they react at the drop-in center. So our youth, after, you know, we're doing things kind of um, either online right now. So after they go through a three-step hiring process and pass these three steps, the fourth step, would be to meet with the survivors. The survivors ask their own questions. They have great questions, like great questions to ask. So there are as many survivors that want to join. So sometimes it's 10, sometimes it's 15. And the reason why we do that, because that's how many people are at the center, right? So I have to make sure how they react and how they react to the youth's questions. Then the next thing we do in our hiring process, the youth actually have votes at Courtney's house. So they vote, guess what? They vote right then and there on the fourth interview if they pass and why not? So now you may see, oh no, that's probably hard on the applicant. This is for the survivor to see because are we putting them on showcase? Don't we expect them to ask our questions right away, right in front of us the first time they met you? So we're making this an environment that they should be comfortable. I always tell the youth, this is your house. We just happen to work here. So with that being said, everything is traces. So I want to talk about some of the things Deborah talked about how we started in Sophie. We call that our welcome committee. And that actually, you've started it. 
they wanted to have a welcome committee, they named it, and they wanted to introduce the youth. So this can be virtually as well. They take them around the drop-in center, which is not housing, it's a drop-in center. And they take them around with their phones, they introduce it without me being present. Why? Because we have a full food program, we have fun activities. I think they're great, but it's really not up to me. The youth should be able to have a space where they say how they feel about things without me hovering over them watching their words. So are you creating a space, right? These are easy spaces. We are not asking for big things right away. These are small things that we actually can create, but I am a true manual and resources person. So to me, if I'm just telling you this and it's not in my protocols and procedures or my manual, then it doesn't exist, right? Because these are real protocols and procedures that we need to implement to make sure that they have a voice in things. So that's one, all our activities that we do, the youth pit, so they pick it. I always say you pick it and I go back for it. That's how that works. So they're always able to have a voice, our youth policy group. Let's talk about consultation fees. So I'm talking about the government fee of 620 um, a day is what the youth for 14 year old is getting right now. Because why should she not get that for getting all her information and resources? Why should we say, I have a $20 gift card. I have a $50 gift card to help you one time. Here you go. That's not teaching them anything that's using them. So we're trying to make sure that they understand and also know how to fight for what they need funding and not to take a little bit. They're learning from us every day. Okay, you've absorbed everything you do. So I always tell my staff, things have to be good for you too. So for the staff, I do want to talk about counseling because what Deborah said is, is real. Um, traumatized, you might get traumatized by working with the youth and hearing their stories. So all staff get free counseling at Courtney's house. It is a requirement. Um, they're out of state. So we have people who are on the phone. I did that on purpose. I don't personally want to talk to anybody that I work with every day about my trafficking situation. So I also continue counseling. So if I'm making these policy and procedures, I always tell the kids, well, the rules apply to me. They'll say, Miss Tina, can we bend this rule? And I say, no, you wrote it. And I wrote, so now we got to follow it. So they write a lot of the other rules. They help write our protocols and procedures for the drop-in center. Sophie has gotten a chance to meet a lot of our youth. And I think, I think they're really smart, but they also, are doing amazing things like on their own. They wanna to go to college. They wanna have degrees. You know, they wanna run businesses as well as Emu was talking about and Sarah helping them. Actually one of our youth who just turned 23, she wants to sell hair, do hair. And guess what? We just helped her get her license. We were able to raise funding for the license. It takes forever in a pandemic. <laughs> it just really takes forever in the pandemic. But we were able to raise that. So like Emma was saying on that, what else are we doing? We're a long-term program. So how long is your program? Emma was talking about the difficulty of working with people for a few months, but now they graduated. So with us, we don't have a time restraint. I have youth that are 25. I've known them since they were 14. They did really great. And then they did really not so great. And they had a fall because maybe something devastating happened in their life. So just thinking about that, which answers those questions. Now we're almost done. Then look at our time. But we have time quickly for one last question. So I wanna ask a last question to wrap us up. And it's a research uh, question. Uh, and I do. And the question is, do you have any advice in terms of how to engage with survivors or persons who are in modern slavery in an ethical, supportive and empathetic manner, please? I thank you in advance for this. How do you include them into research, valuable research? That's such a great question. Who wants to take that on? Sophie? I think, so I think one of the, I cannot emphasize on the importance of data and the importance of being evidence-based. And I think as someone who's really keen on research, one of the things that we also have to do, especially when people I think when I was at heart and people are constantly coming to request whether we can actually have survive, you know, do research on, you know, survivors constantly, you know. So you have, maybe you have 
a hundred survivors you're engaging at a time and you constantly have people. So let's say I have five people and I always give this scenario to researchers. Let's say I have five requests from researchers to do, you know, to do research on survivors. Five, let's say in a month. If I use the same client, this client basically would have to retell their story five times. And I'm saying, we, as researchers, also the question of engagement with survivors, we really have to question, is it really necessary? Some of the data can be collected. Some of the organizations like Tina's organization, like HART, like all the organi grassroots organizations have data that they have sitting that could be used that you could actually analyze, just go and actually collect so that you don't even have to interview 10 survivors and think about what are the ethical ways we could actually do it. And that would lead us to a different conversation of how do grassroots organizations actually collect data from survivors? Because survivors don't have to consistently, you know, be retelling so that people can study them and can research them. So there are ways. Right now, I think I work for Liberty Shared. Liberty Shared has the victim case management. I would encourage many organizations if, to have a case management system with data that can actually be analyzed. We need to move to a place of good data so that some of we can minimize some of the risks that we are talking about for engagement. I will also say, speak about the fact that we have a, a we have an organized, I've seen Tina do it again. We have survivors actually showing you models. I've seen Tina do it and I've seen Survivor Alliance do it where they actually train their, their, their survivors on how to conduct research and how to actually collect data from research. So how do you do participatory research with survivors? And if you really approach organizations that are ethical, that are working with survivors ethically, then it's very easy for you you to then just model what they're doing because we are not also not asking researchers to go and learn everything on how to handle survivors if there's already a survivor-led organization that is working and can show you i know tina has a, a uh, has survivors that have been trained on research and they've done research. I know Survivor Alliance has done a lot of training on research. At the moment right now, I'm working with HART, with survivors and we are doing, and I saw Helen here, Make big up uh, Helen, we are doing with the, the Rights Lab, we are doing a, uh, an ethical storytelling research together with, with survivors. So if you actually allow, or again, I think, I've been saying this so many times. If you consult, it's it's easy to actually understand what are those best practices. But for me, I'll say, what is the available data that we have, first of all? What is the available data? Because I feel like as a movement, there is a gap in the quality of data that we are collecting. And we really have to, and the people paying the price for the lack of quality data, the, the, our, our inability to collect quality data is survivors when we need to do research. So may that be a motivation as an organization for you to collect quality data, because then it means that if a researcher comes, you can easily give data that can be analyzed. You don't have to call 50 survivors to be interviewed about data that has been collected by three, four times. Survivors have said that on average, for them to receive care, they've spoken to, they've had to retell their story five to eight times. Five to eight times, think about that. And then think about as a research, as a researcher, why you'd need to rehear that story if somebody else has already collected it and it's somewhere and it's been analyzed. So for me, it's looking at what are the tools we have? How can we empower grassroots organizations to actually be able to collect data and to constantly be analyzing it so that we don't have these moments where we are rushing, you know, now we need to do a research on this. How can we ensure that we are constantly learning as a movement in the work that we do? It's not easy, but it's actually possible if all of us pick the sections that we're supposed to be working on. Well, thank you all. That time flew by. 
I want to thank you all for being on the panel, getting up so early in the morning to join us. And really, I love the conversation. So many people did. So thank you all for the conversation. Um, Sarah, thank you as well to adding to the conversation and letting people know how they can go about doing this. Thank you again, Al. So we're back to you, Zoe. Thank you. On behalf of the Freedom from Slavery Forum, I want to thank everyone who joined, who participated. Just a couple quick takeaway thoughts, if that's okay. We've really been wrestling today with that difference between paying lip service, I guess, to being survivor informed and actually taking action to being so. And I think what's been really powerful is that call for moving from tokenism to what Deborah described in her brilliant keynote as survivor governance about meeting that challenge that, that Sophie set us of working so that survivors take our chair at the table. And I think we've generated some really concrete ways forward for actually moving beyond a focus on surviving to what the survivor leader Mindang, director of the Survivor Alliance has called a full freedom, a full freedom. And it's a call for a new kind of movement and it's a call for all of us to respond. And let me note, we've been trying to do this in the Rights Lab, which I direct in the UK including through incubating the Survivor Alliance, which then became an independent NGO. It's our key partner. We've been hiring survivor researchers and funding survivor PhD scholarships, writing grants with survivor PIs, but we've got so much more work to do. And so today's conversation has given me also a new blueprint for action. We want to just really encourage you to put your own last takeaway thoughts in the chat field. We want to include them in the written report about this forum. We're hoping that report will be a kind of roadmap for action, a, a way forward. And we're gonna leave this Zoom link open for at least five minutes. Come back tomorrow. The forum focuses on fundraising, on resource mobilization, and we'll have another great lineup. We'll have speakers from governments, from foundations, from anti-slavery organizations. It's the same Zoom link, the same time. I hope you can join us then. Thank you, everybody.